Okay, okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to uh, greet you all with the beginning of the Russian Ophthalmology Society Symposium at the 79th All India Ophthalmology Congress, which is this year virtual, but hopefully will be uh, back again to offline next year. And we're very pleased uh, with my colleague, uh, Nadezhda Pazdeva, to uh, introduce uh, the Russian Ophthalmology Society session uh, and uh, uh, to commemorate the years of friendship in between us and the uh, in All India Ophthalmology Society. And let me hand over uh, this session to Professor Kataev who will be the chairman and the leading driving force uh, uh, today, uh, introducing and discussing all the speakers. Uh, please, Professor Kataev. Uh, thank you for conveying the word. Uh, first of all, I have to thank all the organizing committee, the president of the All Indian Ophthalmological Society, and all the organizers and the, uh, the qualified team and not to lose time, we shall start now. Uh, 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 according to the uh, pronounced schedule, that will be uh, Pavel Banshikov uh, with his report. Можно начинать. Включать демонстрацию экрана. Я первый, да? Да. Окей, просто я был последний. Но поскольку она уже объявила, будем так... Так, демонстрация экрана. Все видно, поехали. Люхеями клеили, and uh, вы видите, да? Все нормально. Все видно, да, все слышно. Hi everyone, everyone. I'm going to present uh, uh, the clinical case of the reconstruction after severe com <coughs> concomitant injury of the eye, eyelids, and orbit. Uh, primary plastic reconstruction of severe combined ophthalmic injuries is a complex clinical challenge uh, in terms of getting morphofunctional and cosmetic results. <coughs> Purpose. Demonstration all the results of complex surgical rehabilitation of a patient uh, with concomitant traumatic injury to eye, eyelids, and orbit. In our clinic, we have had a patient 14 years old. Uh, in this picture, it is already five days after injury due a road accident, and also primary surgical treatments of uh, eyelid and uh, cornea spiral injury. Objective, objectively upon admission, uh, right uh, eye's uh, vision was zero. Uh, in the photo, you can see <clears throat> sutured wounds of the eyelids, face, upper eyelid defect uh, uh, 25 by 20 millimeters, deformation of the inner corner, shortening of the ho horizontal size uh, of the palpebral fissure. There is no patency of the lacrimal passage. I uh, hypotonics is hypotonics uh, suited uh, suited uh, cornea spiral wounds. On the B scan, uh, you can see game of thalamus, uh, retinal detachment, subotrophy of uh, the eye, and uh, anterior posterior axis of the eye, uh, fifteen point three millimeters. On this slide, uh, you will see uh, computed uh, tomography of the orbit. Uh, you can see a fracture of the medial, inferior, and uh, lateral walls of the orbit. Defect of the, of the inferior walls of the orbit uh, 2.05 by uh, 1.0 centimeters. Uh, the eye is reduced in size. Uh, the vitreous cavity is absent. Diagnosis. Corneal scleral 
injury. Uh, detachment uh, of the medial ligament of the eyelid, damage of the lacrimal sac, coloboma of the upper eyelid, post-traumatic fracture of the lower medial lateral walls of the orbit, contusion of the orbit tissues uh, of the four degree, condition uh, after primary surgical treatment of the right eye. On the uh, first stage uh, of surgery, uh, we did uh, plastic uh, surgery uh, of the inferior and medial orbital walls. Uh, then uh, we did uh, uh, dacryocystorinostomy and uh, plastic of the medial ligament, shooting uh, of the, uh, to the periosteum. Uh, then we did uh, plastic uh, restoration of coloboma uh, fixation of uh, the upper eyelid levator of the tarsal plate. Uh, closure uh, of a skin defect with a free skin flap uh, from behind the ear. On this uh, photo, on the, uh, on the second photo, um, uh, you can see a patient before surgery. On, uh, on the first photo. Uh, on the second uh, photo, you can see um, the patient after uh, three days after surgery, uh, you can see a vitalized graft of the upper eyelid. On the third photo, uh, you can see um, third months after surgery, restoration of the eyelid anatomy and uh, subatrophic eyeball. On the second stage of surgery, after three months, uh, we did a restoration of a functionally and cosmetically uh, unpromising subatrophic eye. Plastic surgery of the uh, muscular skeletal stump and uh, temporary eye prosthetics. This is a result. Restoration uh, of orbital uh, cavity uh, volume uh, formed by macular skeletal stump and uh, temporary prosthesis. Uh, but uh, existence uh, of the dystopia of the inner corner. <coughs> of the third state uh, of surgery, after six months, uh, we did correction uh, of uh, psychiatrical dystopia of the medial angle uh, using skin z plasty and individual ocular prosthetics. This is the result uh, in a corner symmetry, uh, cosmetic correction uh, with uh, an eye prosthesis, uh, preservation of the palpebral upper eyelid uh, circus. After uh, fourth stage, uh, this is uh, fourth stage uh, of the surgery. After six months, uh, we did correction of the palpebral uh, circus uh, with a free dermal uh, fat flap. On the third photo, uh, you can see result after individual eye prosthesis, uh, correction of the inner angle and uh, upper eyelid. Uh, on this slide, uh, result uh, after 1.5 years after, in, uh, after injury, uh, good uh, mobility of the musculoskeletal stump and uh, good mobility of the pro uh, prosthesis. Uh, prosthesis, yes. On this slide, uh, you can see uh, the correct position of implant of the orbit uh, according. Uh, and uh, to to spiral uh, to the spiral computed uh, tomography here, and um, on the second photo you can see condition um, of the dacryostomy or the uh, in the uh, rhinoscopic picture. Yeah. At the final stage. <clears throat> At the final stage of the examination, uh, 1.5 years after injury, it was found that uh, the width, length, and shape of the palpebral fissure did not clearly differ uh, from the healthy side. 
The mobility uh, of upper eyelid is uh, restored and the function uh, of the locom uh, locomotion is uh, preserved. There is a normal position and good mobility of the eye prosthesis. Uh, conclusion, complex uh, speciali specialized uh, rehabilitation uh, using the achievement of uh, modern uh, reconstruct, uh, reconstruction, uh, reconstructive ophthalmic surgery uh, allow to uh, maximally uh, restore the anatomy uh, of the eye and uh, uh, function of his uh, of its adnexa. To carry out cosmetic uh, prosthesis uh, with the achievement of a good aesthetic outcome. Thank you for attention. Thank you for the nice presentation with excellent clinical result. If any questions appear, uh, we accepted it in the written form. Now we shall proceed to the next uh, speaker, that is Professor Kulikov, uh, the head of the uh, the head of ophthalmologist of uh, the military forces of the Russian Federation. Welcome. Uh, good morning, dear colleagues. Thank you so much for invitation to AIOC 2021 conference. Uh, it is a great honor for me to be here. An eye injury is one of the leading causes of vision loss and disability worldwide. An open globe injury ranges from uh, 67 to 84 percent among all eye injuries. An open block injury with localization of a foreign body in the posterior segment of the eye takes from 37 to uh, 51 percent of all cases of such injuries. Magnetic foreign bodies constitute from uh, 65 to 90 percent of all intraoperal foreign bodies. Thus, the issue of removing the magnetic intraocular foreign bodies is very relevant. Modern ophthalmotraumatology is primarily vitreoretinal surgery, more than 65% of patients. Currently, the main caliber of instruments used in the vitreoretinal surgery is 25 gauge. The tips of a 25 gauge caliber for a permanent magnet are not produced by manufacturers. Uh, the available uh, 25 gauge forceps are not always convenient for removing intraocular foreign bodies. Thus, there is a need to create a 25 gauge caliber magnetic tip adapted for vitreoretinal surgery. The purpose of our study was to compare the 25 gauge tips for a permanent magnet of various lengths with the Professor Volkov's standard uh, 20 gauge tips. Uh, we made and compare the 25 gauge tips of length of 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, and 45 millimeters with the Professor Volkov's standard tips. The following parameters uh, we investigated the vector of magnetization the magnetic field area, the width and the length of the magnetic zone, the force of attraction, the distance at which magnetization begins. We received clinical approval and con conducted testing on patients. In 70% of cases, when using the Professor Volkov's tip, the magnetization occurred not at the end of the magnetic tip, but to its base. In 10% of cases, this effect was observed when using the 25 gauge tip 25 millimeters long. When we consider this effect dangerous with uh, iatrogenic complication. And further, we investigated and used only 25 gauge tips over lengths from 30 to 45 millimeters in patients, since when using them, fixation of intraocular foreign body always occurred only at the top. 
magnetic spectra obtained with iron powder and magnetic membrane allow visualize and evaluate the magnetic field, the magnetic field direction and distribution, the magnetic field strength, the area of magnetic field projected on a two-dimensional surface in the Excel plan was the Professor Volkov's tip, uh, 28 square millimeters for our 25 gauge tips from 3 to uh, 10 square millimeters, depending on where length. The length of the magnetic zone over top of the tip was for Professor Volkov's tip, 8 millimeters for our tips from 3 to 5 millimeters. The width of the magnetic zone at the top of the tip was for our tips from 1 to 3 millimeters, depending on the length for Professor Volkov's tip, where we, uh, we were not able to register this parameter due to the complete magnetization of all powder by the magnet itself, not by the tip. To study the magnetic force of attraction, steel balls with a mass of 0.3 grams were used. The total mass of maximum number of balls magnetized uh, to the working end of the test tip was determined. We found that even the tip of a maximum length of 45 millimeters makes it possible to fix foreign body weighing up to 11 grams. When using uh, low, uh, longer tips, the foreign body magnetization distance is expectedly reduced. When using a tip 45 millimeters long, the distance is one millimeter. Uh, the tip from uh, 40 to uh, 30 to 45 millimeters long are preferable. Assisting a smaller magnetic force, they allow to fix intraocular foreign body uh, weighting from uh, 11 to 26 grams for, uh, more precisely. This is sufficient in most cases. This film demonstrates uh, the removal uh, intraocular foreign body using 25 gauge teeth. The foreign body is fixed by the magnet and cleaned from the vitreous body. After that, uh, it is moved to the anterior chamber through the posterior capsular axis and removed the faucets through cataract axis. The operation ends with a subtotal vitrectomy and, and intraocular lens implantation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Kolikov. That was a very interesting presentation and with physical rules that can rule our practice. And it's practically very useful to know where we can use and with what effect we can use magnetic devices. Uh, this is very practical. If any questions arise, we can accept it in written form or maybe in oral form. Uh, I would like to present the next speaker. Uh, that will be Nadezhda Pozdeva. She is absent in the Rostov von Don now on the Vitor Retinal Conference. Uh, and so uh, we uh, put her uh, presentation in a recorded form. Can you see it all right? Yes, sir.
Please unmute. So no audio. So no audio for this video. Here you can see a standard posterior chamber RL is implanted into the it's back, and the C0 model iris prosthesis is placed in the sulcus. This is a case of secondary iris prosthesis implantation over the previously placed IL. This is analogous to the case we have just seen, but here are these implanted with forceps via four point.
implantation by folding forceps through a 4.5 mm cornea scleral tunnel with switch fixation in ciliary sulcus using a reverse corneal scleral Hoffman tunnels. This case also illustrates ILD implantation by folding forceps with suture fixation in silver sulcus using non-absorbable Gore-Tex sutures. When used in the setting of simultaneous keratoplasty, first, reverse scleral tunnels are made for later suturing. Then, the cornea is refined to allow ILD placement. Later, the corneal transplant is sutured. Postoperative gonioscopy, ultrasound by microscopy, OCT, demonstrate limited contact of the LD support elements with the silver zone and ample space between them to allow free passage of the aqueous. The implants I am talking about have a track record in Russia starting 2003, and now we have reached a 600 implantation milestone. Raper ILDs are C marked and are available in Europe. Our personal experience currently involves 297 ILD implantations for traumatic aneuridia. Concomitant tocal pathology requiring preliminary surgery was seen in 270 patients, which account for 92% of all implantations. Immense variability in pathology accompanying aneuridia makes it difficult to correctly compare visual results of the surgery. Nonetheless, a trend of postoperative uncorrected visual acuity getting close to preoperative best corrected visual acuity is obvious. Post-op uncorrected distance visual acuity equaled maximum potential pre-op best corrected visual acuity. Maximum visual acuity is usually attained two uh, to three years after surgery. The trend of visual acuity decrease at four to five years presumably reflects the negative selection bias with sicker patients more easily available for follow-up. For example, 
uh, low initial endothelial counts gradually decline and lead to bellus keratopathy. Keratoplasty is most frequently performed uh, several years after implantation. Intraocular inflammation, as assessed by laser cell flare photometry, is detectable before ILD implantation and many years afterwards. That implies severe compromise of the blood aqueous barrier as a result of serious trauma resulting in iris loss. Complications included progressive decrease in endothelial cell loss, IOPD compensation in pre-existing secondary glaucoma, new cases of secondary glaucoma, uveitis, concentration of ILD, retinal redetachment. Complications most often develop from the 6th to 12th months after implantation. All complications were treated medically or surgically. These photographs illustrate cosmetic results. Excellent cosmesis was achieved in all cases. Glare disability was eliminated in most cases. 90% of patients noticed decrease in photophobia. In conclusion, today ophthalmic surgeons have many options at their disposal for meaningful rehabilitation of patients with iris loss. Rapid devices, along with widely known prosthesis from Morcher of Tech Human Optics, are effective at fixing extensive iris defects. The selection of appropriate corrective approach in any individual case should rest on its specific clinical details. Thank you for your kind attention. Can you, uh, uh, there was a fascinating presentation by Nadezhda Pazdeva. She is an excellent and outstanding surgeon uh, on the anterior segment of the eye, collecting the, uh, the real uh, for the camera. Uh, she is an engineer, she is a biological engineer, uh, who is able to collect this device. And it is it's fantastic. Now, the next presentation, I would uh, proceed with uh, uh, Nadezhda Baranova and uh, invite her to the microphone. Uh, I'm sorry, to uh, Galina Chernakova, that will be right. Galina Chernakova. Just a moment. Dear colleagues, good day. Uh, let me express my special thanks to uh, Professor Kataev uh, and my hot uh, best wishes from Moscow outside is 35 degrees Celsius to my Indian colleagues. Uh, I am going to discuss uh, today some aspects concerning human herpes virus uh, type 6 and its critical role in ordinary keratitis development. So why do we speak today about this virus? May it play some special role in keratitis development, despite the well-known fact that uh, herpes simplex virus uh, type, type 1 is considered to be the most frequent etiology agent for herpetic keratitis. So in contrast to coronaviruses, external aggressors, herpes viruses are long life guests in our organism. And Professor Hendricks gave them exact definition. Once got into our house, they never leave it. These characteristics without exaggeration, we may attribute to all eight herpes viruses. No doubt, uh, polymerase, chain polymerase chain reaction, PCR, is a precise and useful tool for her herpetic keratitis develop, uh, diagnostics. In modern world practice, herpes viruses are detected either in uh, tear fluid uh, or in cor corneal scra scrapes in cases of presumed herpetic keratitis and in anterior chamber fluid or even in vitreous in cases of herpetic uveitis or for example, uh, acute retinal, uh, retinal necrosis. Many authors consider PCR screening, uh, total PCR screening for six or seven herpes viruses, except a human herpes virus eight should be held. Robert et al. in 
2002 published the results uh, of the first successful attempt of multiplex PCR use by corneal inflammation. After him, many authors from different countries started exploration of PCR possibilities by herpetic keratitis, keratouveitis, and endotheliitis. And the most representative I found for this presentation were, were Sugita 2013 and Nakana 2020. Dr. Javeta Joseph and Al, uh, it's uh, a uh, quite recent publication in Indian Journal of Ophthalmology uh, 2019 concludes that quantitative PCR methods, method is extremely informative by herpetic keratitis. Dr. Manish Achraya from New Delhi also supported this point of view, pointing out that PCR acts as a powerful adjunct in the diagnosing viral keratitis. Besides, however, careful history taking and clinical exam. But what in fact has turned me being an ophthalmologist towards herpes human virus 6? My own research results. As you can guess from these graphics, it reflects six herpes virus detection rates in tear saliva by herpetic keratitis of long lasting protracted course. As you may see, human herpes virus 6 has the highest rate by this condition in tear in saliva. But why? Herpes simplex virus establishes its, its latency in trigeminal ganglion. It's an, a well-known fact. As well as varicel, varicella zoster virus, after varicella infection or after varicella vaccination, it harbors in trig, trigeminal or dorsal, dorsal ganglia. But where does human herpes virus 6 leaves? Let's get some information from pathologists. Katarina Höfner et al. 200, uh, 2007, using nested polymerase chain reaction, determined this virus in different ganglia, including trigeminal. Moreover, it co occurred with herpes virus, uh, simplex, uh, simplex virus type 1 or varicella zoster virus in 91% of material. Erin Herberts et al. detected human herpes virus 6 DNA in nasal mucose samples, showing the nasal cavity is a reservoir for this virus. And finally, Evona Plazinska Sarosek et al. found uh, DNA of all six herpes viruses in trigeminal or facial ganglia of cadavers but human herpes virus 6 was the most prevalent of all herpes viruses. And this fact clearly, uh, partly clears uh, why this virus is, has the highest rate in my investigations. Uh, comparison of human herpes virus 6 detection rates in healthy uh, versus patients with uh, herpetic keratitis Showed, shows significant, dif significant difference between these groups, 7.4 in healthy versus 45.8 uh, in herpetic keratitis. Moreover, uh, herpes, uh, human herpes virus 6 viral load um, by quantitative PCR in tears and saliva significantly differs in these groups. Uh, by Mano Whitney for independent samples and, uh, samples and by uh, analysis of variations. A role of this virus in eye inflammation uh, uh, development has been widely discussed in literature since the first publication in 1999 by Kuavi till publication by Onda in 2019 who reported a clinical case of um, uh, endotheliitis development caused by this virus uh, after intravitreous, uh, intravitreal injection of ranibizumab. In order to imagine how this virus may act in case of herpetic keratitis development, let's discuss a small clinical example. A 35-year-old Caucasian woman, contact lens wearer, had lost in long-lasting complaints, 
pain, blurred vision, a tearing, photophobia for the period of six months. And as you can see from this picture, she has a persistent, round, clear, corneal ulcer with created shaped bottom. She has got uh, short courses of acyclovir per os previously. In general status, nothing special except chronic tonsillitis. We performed uh, uh, quantitative PCR uh, and in tears, saliva, serum, and urine. Uh, varicella zoster virus and human herpes virus 7 negative everywhere. Relatively small amounts of uh, herpes simplex virus and citimegalovirus, probably due to short courses of nucleosid analogs previously, and in all four biological secrets, human herpes virus 6 with maximum in saliva, uh, 64,000 copies. She was treated with the uh, intravenous acyclovir plus famciclovir per os. A local, a local uh, therapy include tropicamid, lubricants, and bro bromfenac twice a day. Uh, already uh, in 10 days, we have observed epitalization. Uh, granulation tissue instead of crater-shaped ulcer. But what we have got in PCR? At the same time of obvious clinical improvement and, uh, and fine general status, quantitative PCR showed elevation of viral amounts in all, all biological secrets except saliva. In saliva, twice reduction. Systemic antiviral treatment has been continued. Uh, so in a month, we achieved finally complete epitalization. Uh, as you can see uh, on these graphics, um, uh, we have elevation uh, of this virus in all secrets except saliva during therapy. And then gradient reduction of viral load to the moment of recovery till undetectable amounts. Red line, saliva load, yellow, blue, and green, tears, urine, serum. Since we understand that PCR detects namely viral DNA, so higher amounts uh, during uh, antiviral therapy may reflect status of massive presence of viral DNA, but not viral replication in biological secrets due to massive destruction of infected, infected cells during antiviral therapy. Moreover, these uh, lab findings were observed along with clinical improvement. Uh, initially, high human herpes virus 6 amounts in saliva taken in consideration with chronic tonsillitis, in, in this case, may reflect the viral location and source for eye inflammation. All the more, uh, human herpes virus 6 amounts in saliva seem to be pretty high even after achieving recovery. So let me make some conclusions. Human herpes virus 6 uh, is a serious pathogen, usually underestimated by ophthalmologists. Long-lasting course of herpetic keratitis may be conditioned by this uh, virus by its production in trigeminal ganglion. And successful outcome should be achieved by high dose of intravenous or per -os antiviral therapy for at least four weeks. And local therapy should include uh, metriotics and lubricants. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Galina Chernakova is an outstanding uh, specialist concerning uh, herpes virus infections. Uh, she is uh, a well special, excellent specialist and one of, uh, is a rare specialist uh, who is deep in the problem and acts with it very, um, very well. Now, if uh, questions will appear, we shall discuss them. And now I shall convey the word to the uh, Igor Plisov. The next presentation, uh, Igor Plisov is the head of the uh, uh, department and the branch um, of Fedorov's Institute in Novosibirsk. And that institution is one of, of the centers of uh, strabism strabismology in Russia, in Russian Federation. 
And his opinion is very important for all, not only for uh, uh, Novosibirsk, but uh, for all uh, astrobismologists in Russia and abroad. So I shall invite uh, you to hear his presentation. Thank you very much, Mikhail Georgievich. Dear colleagues, dear chairman, I would like to present my report about our experience to treat, to treat patients with primary inferior oblique colorection. As you will know, the functional significance of the inferior oblique muscles for human localization in three-dimensional space is unreasonable. In primary position, the inferior oblique muscles causes excessive adduction, elevation, and abduction of the eye. Its primary action as an excise rotator is greatest in abduction, maximum at 39 degrees. Its action as an elevator is greatest in abduction, maximum at 51 degrees. According to CMAS classification, overreaction of the inferior oblique muscles is overreaction in abduction. There are two clinical types of the inferior oblique overreaction. Primary, without ipsilateral superior oblique palsy or contralateral superior erectus palsy, and secondary, dysplasia of the cyclobiotical muscles. In primary reaction of the inferior oblique with ovulation on the abducted eye, which increases with increasing abduction. Usually, there is no vertical deviation in the primary position and no cyclic deviation. Therefore, there is no torticollis. The Bilshevsky head tilt test result is negative. Primary and inferior oblique overreaction are not congenital and rarely are noted in patients younger than one year. The patient may or may not have an associated horizontal deviation of the eye. Primary overreaction is very common pathology. It's diagnosed in 72% of primary patients with infantile esotropia in 30% of patients with esquired esotropia, and accounts for about 17% of all hypotropia. Oblique muscles hypofunctional was graded in the approximately 45 degrees abducted eye on a five-point scale from zero to plus four overreaction. For this fixating abducted eye, first remain elevated by approximately 30 degrees above mid level. The reaction on the inferior oblique muscles was graded in approximately seven degrees increments. For example, the adducted eye with a plus three overactive inferior oblique muscles would be approximately 22 degrees up to when the abducted fixating eye. The basic rule of thumb is a patient have plus two or more inferior oblique overaction are candidates for an inferior oblique surgery. Patients with minimal inferior oblique overreaction, but a significant V pattern greater than 15 prism dioptries are exception for this rule. This patient should be considered for inferior oblique weakening, even to version minimal inferior oblique overreaction. Primary inferior oblique overreaction is usually bilateral and almost always requires bilateral surgery. In cases of asymmetric overreaction, bilateral surgery should be performed even when one eye displays only plus one overreaction to avoid unmasking the minimal overreaction. If amblyopia is present greater than two snail and lines difference, it is safer to restrict surgery to the amblyopic eye. In these cases, monocular surgery is sufficient because the sound eye is always fixing and will not manifest an upshoot. The success rate after surgical treatment considered as an inferior oblique overreaction no more than one plus, plus one. Uh, how do we treat this pathology of the oculomotor system? With a combination of primary overreaction and esotropia, the tactics of the surgical treatment depends on the features of the alleviation. If esotropia exceeds 20 degrees and abduction is limited, the first step is to weaken the medial rectus. As a second stage, the weakening on the inferior oblique muscles is performed by the optimal method. If as a deviation value does not exceed 15 degrees and there is no restriction of abduction, then the first step is to eliminate the reaction on the inferior oblique muscles. Next, we eliminate 
the horizontal component of strabism. Marshall Pax once described the inferior oblique muscle surgery as the last bastion of motility disorders to be conquered. Analysis of the literature showed what the when 150 years history of strabism surgery, the techniques of the weakening of the inferior oblique muscles have undergone a dramatic development, are at the same time very diverse. In our surgical practice, we use camera session Z or W shaped partial marginal myotomy or myectomy. The choice of operation depends on the amount of hypertropia in the adduction. Botox injection are indicated for hypertropia in a deduction of not more than 15 degrees. For visualization of the inferior oblique muscles, we perform a phonical incision. The muscles is pulled by the tenon capsule without anatomical disruption of the muscle back. Under visual control, botulinum toxin is injected with an insulin syringe and then Incision is suited with virgin silk. The duration of this procedure is 1.5 to 2 minutes. The success rate or in camera session group was 91%, and these measures did not change after more than six months follow-up. Partial marginal myotomy are indicated for hypertropia in adducted I from 15 to 22 degrees. The set Z or W shaped marginal myotomy were made using an electrothermocagulation. The main stages of this operation are shown on this photograph. The use of an electrocagulation technique for performing incision eliminates bleeding, muscle adhesion to the sclera, and fibrous restrictive changes in the muscles. The short time of performing myotomy contributes to an easy reaction of the surrounding muscles tissue to surgical trauma. And accordingly, the postoperative rehabilitation period is more comfortable for patients. The success rate in this group was 87%. Myectomy are indicated for hypertropia in an adduction more than 22 degrees. The entire width of the inferior oblique muscles is cross-clamped with two small hemostats. The hemostat should be placed approximately 10 to 12 millimeters apart with the near the inferior uh, oblique insertion and the other near the temporal body of the inferior rectus muscles. The muscles be between the clamps are then excited with electrocoagulation. The duration of the myectomy is uh, from five to seven minutes. The success rate of myectomy group was 94%. We observe few side effects in surgical procedures, the range of inferior oblique under action in camera session, marginal myotomy or myectomy procedures was detected in 3, 4, and 3% respectively. Residual inferior oblique overaction, more than plus one, was diagnosed in 5, 10, and 3%. Always the degree on inferior oblique overaction was different in the three groups in pen operative examination with different was not significant and last visit. As a result, the effect of camera session, marginal myotomy or myectomy were equal in all patient at last visit. Therefore, we conclude what all those three procedures are effective for treatment of primary inferior oblique overaction with minimum side effects. The recurrence rates on if, uh, over elevation after inferior oblique weakening, along with the possibility of the inferior oblique muscle is not the primary cause of the problem, has simulated a heightening interest in the anatomy and histology of these muscles. The main conclusion, uh, the main advantages of Botox injection into the inferior oblique is what way can be repeated indefinitely until the etiopathogenic causes uh, to be overaction are eliminated, including during preparations. All our weakening techniques tie our hands together for effective re-surgery. This is my main conclusion about four years of experience in chemodenervation of the inferior oblique in its primary overaction in a comparative analysis with the result 
of treatment using our techniques for 30 years. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Professor Igor, very much for your interesting presentation. We can see the vast interest of uh, interests of ophthalmology in all fields. And uh, strabismus is one of the difficult and uh, specified fields, the uh, region in uh, ophthalmology, ophthalmology science and practice. And it's very important to get the rules and uh, get the understanding of how to act with the muscles to uh, gain proper result and straight vision. Thank you very much. So uh, we shall proceed to the next. <clears throat> uh, presentation. As I uh, said it already, uh, uh, it's uh, ophthalmology has a, a wide interest in all the fields, and uh, one of the most important fields is eye prosthetics. Uh, uh, in current practice, ophthalmologists uh, not very often meet patients with uh, eye prosthesis. And uh, that is why uh, not very often they used to study, to learn uh, how to act, how to handle prosthesis, how to uh, treat patients with eye uh, prosthesis. Uh, Nadezhda Baranova is one, is one of the uh, uh, principal and uh, uh, well-practiced and understandable uh, specialist in eye prosthetics. Uh, she is the head of the North Center of Eye Prosthetics in um, uh, Russian Federation, which is located in St. Petersburg. And uh, uh, they treat all the patients uh, around in the suburbs and on the uh, north part of the European uh, side of the Russian Federation. So I advise you to uh, listen carefully to her recommendations. <clears throat> uh, she depicts one of the small, one of the small um, topic in eye prosthetics that concerns only microphthalmia, but there are a good amount of other topics. So uh, I think you will be impressed with her presentation. Go on, please. Dear colleagues, we are happy to present you the report which topic is peculiarities of ocular prosthetics in macrophthalmia. Microphthalmia is a severe intrauterine abnormality of the visual analyzer. It is characterized by the decrease in the eyeball size by more than 1-2 millimeters comparing with from the normal and functional inferiority of the visual organ. The eyeball has a abnormal structure. The global prevalence of microphthalmia varies between 2.4 and 3.5 per 10,000 births. Congenital microphthalmia is diagnosed in 2.4% to 11.2% of all blind children. In Scotland, the prevalence of microphthalmia and anophthalmia is 19 per 100,000. In California, the prevalence of unilateral and bilateral Anathalmia reaches 0.18 and 0.22 cases per 10,000 births, respectively. In Hawaii, the prevalence is 2.21 per 10,000 births. The Laboratory of Ocular Prosthetics in St. Petersburg reported that the prevalence of congenital microthalmia is not lower than 0.18 per 10,000 births. Congenital macrothalmia can be associated with exogenous and endogenous fractures. Genetic fractures have the most important role in the development of macrothalmia. 50% to 75% of severe ocular disorders are believed to be hereditary. Congenital macrothalmia is often caused by degenerative and inflammatory processes. Some viruses, including rubella virus, cytomegalovirus, influenza virus, influenza virus and coxsackie virus exude a pronounced teratogenic effect. The main risk factors for congenital macrothalmia are maternal age above 40 years, multiple births, 
low birth weight, and low gestational age. Doctors usually fail to identify the main factors that trigger the development of this disorder. Congenital anathalma and microthalma can develop independently or as a part of some syndrome. Pediatrician medical examination is required. In order to find out concomitant somatic pathology, genetics in the case of syndromic conditions. The success of ophthalmic prosthetics is impossible without close cooperation of an ophthalmic surgeon, an eye prosthetist, an ophthalmologist, and a psychologist. While providing prosthesis for a child, an important point is the parent's participation. The condition of the prosthetic child cavity, care for the prosthesis and eye cavity, timely treatment for the purpose of the prosthesis replacing, and accordingly the indicators of the prosthetics in the future mostly depend on them. Of 42 children one month to 16 years old with congenital ocular disorders who were followed at the laboratory of ocular prosthetics in St. Petersburg, 47 had unilateral microthalmia. Five had bilateral microthalmia. Medical diagnostics included external examination of the eye socket, palpebral fissure and eyelids, the assessment of the conjunctival phonic state and the parameters of the conjunctival cavity. Both the reduced and paired eyes were examined with a mandatory assessment of visual functions. Electrophysiological studies, B scan, CT, MRI. Ocular prosthetics is aimed to ensure proper development of the facial skeleton and to stimulate soft tissues and orbital bones by increasing the size of prosthesis and therefore expanding their conjunctival cavity using stepwise prosthetics. Ocular prosthetics in children have some specific characteristics associated with physiologic growth of orbit, eyelids, eyeball, and whole face. 90% of the eye socket growth is completed by five years. Prosthetics in the case of microthalmia. The optimal duration of primary prosthetics depends on the length and the anterior posterior segment of the reduced eyeball at birth. Knowing size and the growth features of the eyeball in the first year of life, it is possible to predict the result of prosthetics and, importantly, the frequency of replacement of the prosthesis during this period. If the value of the eyeball axis is less than 7.5 mm, prosthetics is performed starting from the age of one month. In the case of the eyeball axis more than 7.5 mm, no later than the age of four months of the child's life. In microthalmia, eye prosthesis or the increasing size are used by the method of step-by-step -step prosthetics. These can be both conformers and the eye prosthesis themselves. But since the replacement of prosthesis should be carried out quite often, in the first three, four months from the child's birth, most often we used individually made conformers. This slide demonstrates you the prosthetics results of a child suffering from microthalmia with standard and individual eye prosthesis. It is impossible to install prosthesis of complex shape in the cases of patients with microthalmia. Such a prosthesis is not only sedentary, but also exerts pressure on the reduced eyeball. Therefore, a prosthesis of the correct shape was made in the laboratory. At the same time, the palpebral fissure on the right acquired a natural shape. In the case of congenital macrothalmia, only individual eye prosthetics are optimal. It is impossible to use standard ready-made eye prosthesis in order to compensate all the necessary parameters of the cavity. The eye prosthesis is a foreign body. Therefore, during the primary prosthetics or the macrothalmia, a gradual adaptation within 14 days is required. On the first day, the time of the eye prosthesis wearing is 15 minutes. On the second day, the time of the eye prosthesis wearing is 30 minutes. Gradually, it is possible to increase the time of the eye prosthesis wearing to three hours a day by the end of the week. 
By the end of the second week, the eye prosthesis should be worn all day long. As for a night's sleep, the prosthesis is removed. During the period of adaptation to the eye prosthesis, patients suffering from microphthalmia require the appointment of an antiseptic and reparative drug. You can see the framed photo on the slide. It is the result of an inadequate prosthetics. During the medical examination, we figured out a discrepancy between the parameters of the cavity and the eye prosthesis. Stretching of the eyelid tissues with an excessively large prosthesis. As a result, sagging of the lower eyelid, asymmetric opening of the palpebral fissure, a new individual plastic eye prosthesis was manufactured in the laboratory. The result of prosthetics is affected by the severity of the eyeball hyperplasia, the length of the palpebral fissure at birth, as well as the anatomical condition of the eyelids. Prosthetics is to be started as early as possible, depending on the severity of the eyeball hyperplasia. The slide shows step-by-step -step prosthetics with the individual eye prosthesis. In the case of bilateral microphthalmia, Prosthetics clinically looks like an ophthalmia. According to the MRI data, these are rudiments up to 8 mm with parietal cysts. Step by step individual prosthetics was performed. Different forms of eye prosthesis were made in order to achieve a stable result. This slide demonstrates the result of timely eye prosthetics made by individual patients of increasing magnitude. While looking down, the upper eyelid is symmetrical with the upper eyelid of the paired eye. Late initial application for prosthetics at the age of six years, we noted the shortening of the conjunctival phonix. The patient came across great difficulties in adapting to an ocular prosthesis. Macrothalma on the right side. Macrocornea, coloboma of the choroid and optic disc. In order to accurately assess the size of reduced eye, an ultrasound examination is necessary. Therefore, it should contain two sizes of eyeballs, sagittal size and frontal size. With this macrothalma degree, eye prosthesis are not indicated. The ultrasound in dynamics is recommended as well. Sometimes ophthalmic surgeons resort to conthotomy in order to increase the length of the palpebral fissure. The external conthotomy leads to deformation of the ocular fissure and loss of the possibility of its prosthetics. On this slide, we can see that the outer edge of the prosthesis lies on the skin outside the conductival pharynx. Only an experienced ocularist can make prosthesis. A photo of an eye prosthesis with a defect is presented. Not only prosthesis with micro cracks or prosthesis with poor surface treatment, but also prosthesis that do not correspond to the desired size can cause inflammation in reduced eyeball. Summary The timing of primary ocular prosthetics is of fundamental importance for the symmetrical development of soft tissues and the facial skeleton. If the area of the eyeball axis is less than 7.5 mm, prosthetics is performed starting from the first month of the child's life. The prosthetics of children with microphthalmia is to be carried out only with an individual ocular prosthesis. In order to achieve a good cosmetic result, it is necessary to use a method of stepwise expansion for the cavity with mandatory consideration of the ocular prosthesis material. In the case of the eyeball severe hypoplasia, if it is possible to perform prosthetics of if there is no proper result from conservative treatment, step-by-step -step surgical treatment with an individual approach to each patient is necessary. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Nadezhda. Uh, your presentation proves uh, with the next time that Inocular plastics, it's not impossible to do to work without um, uh, without ocular prosthetics. Uh, maybe half of uh, patients 
uh, use uh, hypothetics in the practice in their practice of multi-step surgery, for example, in trauma or in any other in congenital deformities, in anomalies or violets. And it's very important to uh, for an ocular plastic surgeon uh, to be acquainted with prosthetics, prosthetics and to, to uh, be keen uh, in uh, fitting, in choosing, and uh, assessing uh, the form and the shape of a prosthesis uh, to make adequate result after his surgery which is covered up with uh, hypothetics. Thank you very much. It's very important. Now I think we shall uh, proceed uh, to the last uh, presentation. Uh, that is <coughs> Uh, I will speak about the sequence and methods of reconstruction for severe lesions of our orbital and adnexa. Uh, we have started uh, the session with the uh, reconstructive surgery and we shall end it with that, with, the, with this uh, topic. It is very serious and it's uh, complicated and very important for well-being and uh, for uh, good results of quality of life. In severe trauma with complicated lesions of orbit and nexa uh, is very difficult to charge, to change, and to charge and to assess. Uh, so the main questions when we see the patient uh, is uh, what line should be uh, chosen. And the first line is to save the eye and make all adnexal tissues and structures uh, with good function and morphology to save the eye and enable good vision. And the second line <coughs> is uh, connected is uh, connected with artificial eye with hypothetics, and that line is uh, following the rules of hypothetics to uh, form the cavity, the orbit, uh, the stump, uh, the uh, furnaces. Uh, to ensure a proper, a proper form, proper position of the eye, artificial eye. And these two uh, lines are main uh, features of, the, of managing these uh, patients. Uh, the first line uh, predisposed for, to keep uh, safe, safeness of the eye, to keep it functioning. Uh, this means to eliminate legophthalmus, dystopy, ptosis, strabismus, and motility of the eye globe. While the second uh, uh, line predisposed for artificial eye prosthetics uh, is aimed at uh, achieving proper position of the prosthesis, that is the reconstruction of the socket, the phonosis, the stump, and the eyelids to cover and to ensure uh, proper position of, uh, of the hypothesis. Нет картинки. Презентации. Почему? А сейчас есть? Да, есть. Хорошо, начинаем тогда. Сейчас есть? Картинка видна? Павел Александрович. Да. Картинка Хорошо. видна, сейчас хорошо, да. Хорошо, все. 
uh, and in recent times uh, we meet uh, with uh, one more option that is preparing for the eye globe uh, for keratoprothesis. This is not an ordinary thing because uh, most complications uh, connected with the um, keratoprothesis are extruding of the device and autolomitis. Uh, so uh, the third line is uh, concerned with the preparing of the eye surface of the thickening of the uh, scar tissue of the um, uh, corneal surface to ensure a good position of the eye prosthetics. Uh, before we start with the reconstructive surgery, we must uh, anticipate uh, some actions uh, to uh, uh, pre-reconstruction stage. If there is any infection, abscess, uh, or decrotocytis, uh, we have to eliminate those infections. If we have a leg of thalamus, first of all, uh, we must uh, ensure a good covering of the eye globe to eliminate leg of thalamus and then to anticipate all other stages of reconstructive surgery for the orbit and uh, eyelids. If there are foreign bodies that um, uh, that are in the in the way of the surgeon, which uh, mix the tissues and uh, don't allow to good uh, to uh, make proper surgery in the soft tissues, the foreign bodies should be removed. And uh, finally, when the orbital roof is uh, distorted, when we have the de defect of the orbital roof, we cannot operate on the orbit if there is a herniation of uh, a brain tissue into the orbit. That is why we have to consult to the neurosurgeon and contact with the neurosurgeon uh, to ensure um, uh, good solid protection of the orbital cavity from the cavity of the brain. It's very important and uh, challenging. In the line of eye prosthetics, uh, it is uh, important to uh, time the removing of the worthless eye. Why now should we remove it? If uveitis is uh, positive, is uh, active, uh, we have to remove the eye as soon as possible. If your eye is negative, if we don't have any suspicion of uh, intraocular inflammation, uh, we prefer to reconstruct, to eliminate the eye and reconstruct the stump after orbital reconstruction. Uh, as soon as uh, possible, it's beneficial uh, for eliminating of the eye because uh, uh, the sclera is not so deformed. Uh, it may be shrinked, uh, but it's, uh, it can be expanded uh, not so uh, difficultly. And uh, early evisceration is beneficial for eye prosthetics. You can see the early uh, case with eliminating of the uh, eye with evisceration and uh, performing uh, the good orbital stump. Evisceration as a method of elimination of the eye is preferable against inoculation, even in the case of distorted sclera. You can see the shrink and shrinked um, scleral cavity, the, the, uh, the remnants of the eyeball, but the eyeball was not removed. Uh, this is the sequence, uh, consequence of uh, uh, the uh, severe trauma, and there were no attempts uh, to eliminate the eye. Um, but the deep atrophy of the eyeball um, is present. Even in this case, we have an opportunity uh, to make evisceration and uh, form a good uh, stump a good form of the cavity 
a good support, a good pillow for the eye prosthesis. Preserving the sclera. Uh, orbital implantation in removing uh, of the eyeball is obligative in almost all the patients. I cannot say that in all the patients because there are some severe types of trauma uh, which demand uh, uh, inoculation, elimination of the eye without orbital implantation. I can uh, show you this uh, clinical case. Uh, a boy uh, um, suffered from the shot of the uh, traumatic pistol with the rubber bullet. Uh, the dimensions of the rubber bullet is uh, 12 to 25 uh, millimeters. Uh, the bullet crushed the roof of the orbit and uh, 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 stopped at the uh, uh, end of the uh, cavity. In this case, we have uh, prominent herniation and uh, deformity, uh, distorted tissues in the orbit and implantation of uh, some uh, material into the orbit will be harmful. The uh, stump will be very prominent and will not, uh, we cannot fit prosthesis, proper prosthesis in this cavity. The orbital stage is one of the first stages <coughs> uh, for complex reconstruction, where anticipate uh, the reconstruction by two ways. One way is soft plaster, and the second is hard reconstruction. Um, the orbit is a flame framework for uh, soft tissue, for the eye globe, for eye prosthesis. So first of all, we have to fulfill, to uh, form, to shape the framework of the orbit. Uh, soft plastic means that we put flexible materials over the depressed bone. For example, in this case, we put the uh, PTF plate uh, over the depressed orbital bone. Um, it is filled with a carbon felt uh, the empty portion of the cavity. Uh, the hard reconstruction means that we use titanium implants to form orbital framework when we have no opportunity to put the soft uh, soft um, membranes in the orbit, uh, which will not uh, stay in place. Here you can see the stereolithographic model of the orbits and uh, uh, individually uh, uh, modeled uh, titanium plate, which we used to put in the, uh, uh, at the bottom of the orbit. Uh, here we use the same lithographic model uh, to adapt uh, soft silicon plate. Uh, you can see the uh, uh, previous attempt uh, to reconstruct the orbit with the use of titanium uh, uh, plate and we uh, anticipate uh, further reconstruction, further, further filling of the cavity with soft plate. Uh, the sample of uh, hard reconstruction, uh, we use several titanium plates <coughs> almost uh, all around the orbit, all, all around the edges of the orbit uh, to make uh, the proper framework uh, for the uh, soft tissues. The process of individual modeling uh, looks as it, as it is. First, we uh, take CT scans and uh, send them uh, uh, to the... <laughs> I send it to the uh, company which uh, is uh, which deals with the titanium plates. This is uh, one of the models of the titanium plates. Uh, these are the um, drawings according to our needs, and these are the uh, pre-modeled uh, titanium plates uh, fitted in the orbit. Uh, we can do without individual plates in sometimes uh, 
so we can use <coughs> a standard plates which are designed uh, for orbital reconstruction. Uh, this is a trapezoid uh, uh, titanium plate which we can uh, easily uh, shape. Um, but it has very uh, big holes of uh, uh, big diameter. So uh, to uh, prevent soft tissue uh, drop into that holes, uh, we used to cover it with a thin uh, soft uh, membrane. So to ensure the isolated lower, uh, lower uh, wall of the orbit. The next stage is uh, the stage of uh, soft tissue or reconstruction. Uh, uh, we can operate in plastic surgery only with uh, good soft, uh, thick soft tissue layer. If it is, if we lack soft tissue, we cannot uh, do anything, any transplantation, any moving of the skin, any moving of uh, sub, uh, subcutaneous tissue and to uh, restore muscles and uh, anything else. Uh, so uh, uh, we use uh, dermal fast, uh, dermis and fat grafts to fill the undercutaneous, subcutaneous tissues. Like in here, uh, the lower eyelid is elevated after uh, dermal fat grafting on the lower edge of the orbit. And here in this case, uh, it was very difficult to feel all the parts of the uh, defects of the orbital uh, fractures. Um, but the condition <coughs> was improved and it was uh, made possible to uh, anticipate further reconstructions of the eyelids. Kentai are the major fixing points of eyelids, eyelids, so we have to put the angles of the eye in the proper position. After that, we can uh, move uh, to reconstruction of eyelids themselves. If we follow again the line one, which is connected with eye prosthesis, we have to reconstruct the socket. In many cases, after like here in uh, uh, gunshot injuries, the cavity is absent. And there was uh, made an attempt already to uh, fill it with a skin graft, but it was failed. Uh, the best material for reconstruction cavity is uh, a mucus graft. And here you can see the cavity reconstructed with these grafts <coughs> with good processes. Uh, mucous membrane of the uh, oral cavity is the best material for uh, modeling the uh, cavity for the eye prosthesis. You can see the uh, uh, locations of uh, uh, harvesting and donor grafts of mucous membrane. And here you can see the four grafts which will be uh, uh, placed around the <coughs> artificial eye and uh, put in the, into the cavity. Uh, the sample, uh, the next stage uh, of their reconstruction is orbital implantation. After we make the framework, after we uh, are sure that there is place for prosthesis to stay in the orbit, uh, we have to, uh, to assess the necessity and possibility of orbital implantation in the center of the orbit. Here you can see the uh, deep anophthalmus um, uh, with the empty cavity. And then the next, uh, next after the surgery, the uh, orbital implant is inserted in the center, is located in the center of the orbit and the overall uh, picture is, uh, looks much better. Uh, here is the city, city modeling uh, three-dimensional visual, uh, visualization of the orbit. Uh, first, after uh, modeling of the framework of the orbit, and uh, then the result of the uh, orbital implantation um, uh, where the eyeball is absent. 
this is uh, the stage of uh, orbital implantation. Uh, one might anticipate the line two, uh, the function i. We have to uh, make safeness for the i globe to make it uh, to keep it functioning. Uh, this is the stage of eyeless reconstruction. Uh, usually, this is a multi-step uh, procedure. You can see this uh, uh, patient who was treated for several years. Uh, first of all, here uh, was admitted with some uh, uh, thin layer graft transplant on the bones. After several uh, surgeries, multi-step surgeries, uh, we gained uh, a multi uh, more perfect result. Uh, the residual uh, leg of thalamus is about one millimeter. is uh, not very essential, but it's rather essential. So uh, the next step will, will be needed maybe for eliminating all this uh, one millimeter leg of thalamus. In the case of eye prophetics, uh, we have to reconstruct the eyelids so that, uh, that to ensure their position, the proper position of the eye prosthesis in the orbital cavity. And as usual, it uh, takes several stages. Uh, you can see uh, the uh, deformed absence, only the absence of the eyelids and the absence of the cavity, and the results of uh, almost properly fixed uh, canti and uh, reconstructed eyelids with a rather perfect position of the artificial eye. Uh, again, we go to the line two, the function in eye. Uh, the strabismus is uh, a real uh, challenging uh, problem in uh, complicated trauma. Uh, restricted muscles are very difficult to uh, to act, uh, to do, uh, to operate to in order to make good to ensure good position good and good motility of the eyeball and not every muscle is uh, able even even if uh, we take off the muscle out from the frac fractured bone uh, it can stay uh, rigid uh, not elastic uh, so it's it's not very often uh, in severe trauma uh, not uh, now we can uh, achieve uh, excellent result in eye, eye, eyeball motility. We release uh, the muscles from the restriction from the fractures. Uh, we make uh, muscle substitution with neighbor muscles and we perform recession resection and uh, as an ordinary common stabilism surgery and we use Botox to, as, an, um, as an aid in um, uh, the problems of reconstruction of strabismus. Uh, here you can see the sample of uh, stage of strabismus and eyeball motility. The severe uh, acid deviation, <coughs> paralytic acid deviation uh, with uh, full absence of uh, um, uh, muscular abduct abductus. And the results of the uh, surgery, astrabismus surgery with a good uh, straight position of eyeballs. But nevertheless, the motility of eyeballs is rather restricted. Uh, next, after strabismus surgery, we anticipate the uh, possibility of uh, eliminating of the eyelid tosses, upper eyelid tosses. Uh, in this case, we use methods of elevator reconstructive surgery or, and brow suspension. Uh, the main uh, topic, the main um, uh, predisposition is that we must avoid leg of thalamus, uh, especially in the uh, case of restricted uh, uh, operated on strabismus, because uh, in uh, Small of thalamus, we can achieve, uh, we can get uh, character puffy. And here you can see the uh, uh, rather good results of reconstruction of the uh, levator muscle and uh, functioning eyelid. Uh, 
if we uh, see a patient in the from line one that is with eye prosthesis, we uh, may not follow strictly to the avoidance of the leg of thalamus because <coughs> eye prosthesis uh, can stand for it. Uh, if eye prosthesis is uh, uh, in the condition of leg of thalamus is constantly open we can wet it with some ointments or liquids, and we don't care about the keratopathy after that. And in the case of anophthalmos, it is useless to use brow suspension. So every now and then we use uh, levator surgery to open the eye, and we can anticipate the surgery that is rather dangerous for the open eye, but not so dangerous for the eye prosthesis. Uh, in function, uh, functioning eye, at the stage of lacrimal drainage, uh, we must uh, uh, try to reconstruct the lacrimal pass passage uh, to the nose. Uh, it uh, can includes canalicular restoration, lacquer canalicular stomach, lacquer sister stomach, lacquer renal stomach, or DCR. All, uh, all of the methods uh, are not so very easy, especially in traumatic cases with the surroundings of uh, scar tissue. But uh, we can anticipate to assess the possibility and uh, um, may anticipate our steps, surgical steps, to make uh, the restoration of the lacrimal passage. Uh, here you can see the uh, distorted nose, the broken uh, uh, nasal lacrimal canal, and the results of um, uh, reconstruction, which is uh, which edited um, uh, perfectly. Uh, is the lacrimal drainage is restored. You can see the um, lacrimal probe in the uh, and the lacrimal system, lacrimal system, lacrimal nasal stoma. And uh, see, you can feel that all the stages are multiple, and uh, the whole treatment takes a good amount of uh, stages. Here you can see a sample of uh, almost uh, six years of reconstruction, now uh, beginning with the uh, orbital reconstruction and ending with the uh, eyelashes transplantation. Now uh, this is our thesis. Um, now we get leg of thalamus and uh, the blinking is very poor. Uh, because the uh, restoration of the um, muscles, especially of the uh, musculus orbicularis oculi, is very difficult uh, to make it act, to make it uh, contract. And that is why leg of thalamus is obvious in most cases. Uh, in the conclusion, we have uh, several positions that first of all, we must choose the proper line uh, with the eye or without the eye. And then we have to uh, make framework of the hard orbit. Then we make fixing points for eyelids. Then restore the eyelids. Well, uh, restore the uh, lacrimal pathways. And uh, for the final stages, I need cosmesis. Uh, we have to Eliminate slight uh, little scars, a little deformities of the, uh, uh, the landscape of eyelids, and so on. And uh, finally, uh, many years pass. After all, uh, when we can, uh, when we can drop our heads and uh, say that it's uh, all what I could do. So thank you. Now, uh, I cannot see any questions in the chat. Our agenda is over. 
If any questions from the audience, is there any questions from the our board? So I don't see any questions. We're in time, and we're in time more than we could expect because uh, one uh, report had been um, uh, taken off. So after all, I have to express our uh, warm words, our warm expressions to the organizers of the uh, Indian Ophthalmology Council Congress, uh, which help us to uh, exchange our uh, mutual ideas of the Indian and uh, Russian ophthalmologists. And we can see the vast interests of ophthalmology in all fields. Uh, you can see in all other halls of the Congress, uh, many halls are devoted to many difficult, many difficult problems of ophthalmology. And uh, I hope that we put uh, our fruitful ideas in this uh, in this scan <laughs> in, the, in the can of ophthalmology. Thank you very much. If there is any comment from the uh, uh, so Rabi. Okay, sir. So uh, are we done with all the speakers? There are no no other speakers. One uh, one speaker had been uh, for technical uh, uh, sub, uh, obstacles is uh, taken off. So our agenda is over. Okay, okay, sir. Thank you so much for the wonderful session that we had just now. And with this note, uh, I will conclude the session for today. Thank you so much. Thank you for Thank you. your... Yeah. Thank you very much.